Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Not Your Father's Movies. I am Mike. I'm Vito. I'm Dan. And I'm Jesse, and we are the Dad Fathers, and we coming at you with some 2007 kind of energy. Mm. Some 07 energy, that's right. And uh, this week, we are doing 2007 westerns that are uh, kind of best picture westerns, yeah, except of. one of them. I don't know. There's, there's better connected tissue, though, than you're selling yeah. beyond 2007 and beyond them being westerns, and that connected tissue is. Uh, well... Several crossovers between all of them? No, it's your birthday episode. Oh, it's my birthday episode. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot about that. Happy birthday to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah we're actually coming Mike. at you with some birthday energy. Birthday, happy birthday energy. Mike. Yes, happy birthday. I forgot this was my birthday episode. <laughs> <laughs> this is just, I'm just so excited about like doing these movies finally. Um, so yeah, And you uh, heard so... connective tissue and you're like, all right, let's tackle it now. Yeah, <laughs> Garrett Dillahunt. <laughs> Dillahunt. Well, no, okay, there's a lot. Okay, so so the movies that we are doing for our 2007 Westerns, we've already done 310 to Yuma, so sorry, Russell Crowe, you're not here today. We've got The Assassination of Jesse James by the coward Robert Ford. We've got There Will Be Blood, and we've got No Country for Old Men. Mm. Two of these three movies are extremely important in my life. And one of them I just saw this week. And that is, uh, so the reason why I wanted to do this series was that, you know, two of these movies are really important. And then I saw like an Instagram thing comparing two of them with the assassination of Jesse James. So that's a good one. Which yeah. ones are mm. important. But, and I was like, oh, we should do the assassination of Jesse James like, <laughs> or Robert Ford as well. It's a really long name for a movie. You just call it the assassination. But there's also more yeah. connective tissue too, because Roger Deakins shot, both No Country Two. and Assassination. Yep. Yeah. And, and Garrett Dillahunt is in No Country, no country, country and, and Assassination. assassination. <laughs> and There Will Be Blood and No Country were both filmed in the same spot in Texas. At they the were. same time. At the same time. Yeah. And they were both released by the same production company. Yeah. And they were both the front runners for that 07 Oscar yeah. race. And that was that was the I, I remember, you know, like like getting into fights with people about which one was better. And I was honestly fighting with myself the whole time. Yep. So so that's why we're doing these movies. Anything else? Is there any any other reason why we're doing them? All, all three of them have been incredibly important to me um, in my yeah. adult life. I mean, so I was just really happy to be able to, to talk about all three of them, especially to be able to talk about The Assassination, because that's not a movie that's very widely seen. And I've never encountered someone in the wild that had already seen it. It's actually yeah. a big a big reason why my wife and I began talking when we when we were kind of figuring out dating is that we'd actually both mm. seen that movie. Um, wow. Yeah. So, just so like your school. love is built on the movie about Jesse James getting killed, yeah. assassinated. That's I mean, beautiful. I that's mean, a beautiful love story. Built on blood, right? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, that's just like a little hint for the uh, the nostalgia portion. <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want to take it. It's it's up to you, Mike. All right, all right. Yeah, and like for me too. Uh, there will be blood. No country are extremely important movies um, in my life as as an adult male on the planet Earth. Did you guys have anything to add, Dan, Jesse? I, I... You know, I, I, I will get into to my my histories with all with all the movies soon. Dan, do you have anything to add? <laughs> uh, I besides just saying that, like these movies, kind of formed my expectations for movies in a lot of ways, in a weird way, but in a really profound way. And I didn't really realize that until maybe in the last couple of years. But yeah, I'm very excited to talk about these. These are all very top tier for me and i think for for most of us at least some of these are top tier movies and i i always get excited when like we start a podcast about movies that i consider five star almost perfect movies that's that just gets me excited have you seen yeah. all three of them before uh other than no i had not seen the assassination of i actually have the same experience as mike assassination of jesse james was not one i had seen until you know, yeah same here ah Nice. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> you know, I, I think um, when we first sat down in your garage like two years ago now, a little over two years ago now. Yeah. And we started like drafting up lists of like the most important movies to us to talk about eventually. And uh, when when Dan came on, we were starting to talk about that, like movies that we had to do come hell or high water. There will be blood in no country for old men were high on the list for many of us at least yeah they were, uh, they were high on the communal <laughs> list like we were we, all yeah. three of us were throwing stuff up 
way back when. Because also, happy two year anniversary to us. Yeah, by the way. that's right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but when you're throwing stuff on No Country and There Will Be Blood has always been in the mix. Yeah. And it was just always like, when, when. Yeah. And, and, you know, just at the top here, I know there's there's been a lot of people who over over the last couple of years have said, you know, if I could be on an episode, I'd want to be on an episode for No Country for Old Men. And so, like, we've been debating with ourselves, how are we going to do this this uh, this episode? And we would really love to do an episode with each and every one of you uh, who has said they wanted to talk about No Country, but yeah. it wouldn't be fair to do just one without the other people. So we're going to do it by ourselves. That's that's the, the executive There was no way to here. include everyone in the club. Like, <laughs> there just wasn't a way to do it. For a while, it was thrown around that we interview every single one of them and splice together all their interviews to make one episode. And now we know never to do that because we did that in one of our episodes a while back, a year ago, actually. Listen, year listen ago. back to our never. NYFM anniversary episode, the one that took us all, like, what, each of us an entire works week <laughs> of work to put out? Pretty bad. At least. Yeah, we're never doing that again. Yeah. <laughs> that, was, that was seriously, I think, over 100 hours of work. Oh, geez. I will say No Country is the one that I remember back when I was just a listener that you guys mentioned like every other episode, no country. <laughs> and, uh, and it always was like, Oh man, I, I'm sure they're going to do it like next month. I'm sure they're going to do it the next episode. So yeah, this is exciting for me to listen. Here. Listen, we, we come across as insufferable teases. We're really just bad at planning yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and making decisions. So uh, we made a decision here at the end. It's my birthday. I really wanted to talk about No Country and There Will Be Blood and also the assassination of Jesse James. So here's what we're doing and here's what we've got for you guys. We're really all very excited. Mostly all very excited. We're all excited to talk. Oh, I'm all yeah, excited. We're all excited yeah. to talk. So we're all um, excited. As just to, to talk a little bit about our structure, we're doing something a little bit different. We started this last month. Um, hopefully you're enjoying it. Please let us know what you think. But uh, we're we're recording three episodes all at one time. Um, and so with that, we've got a little bit of a change to the to the order. First part, the first episode that we release is going to be talking about cast and crew and some of our nostalgia about these movies. And then we're going to go into um, into like what we like, what we didn't like, what are where could these movies have been better? Where could they have been worse? Uh, and maybe talk a little bit about how we want to or if we want to show them to our kids. And then finally. We're going to try to get into the meat of this movie in episode three. We're going to talk a little bit more about like the big picture questions. Um, maybe, uh, yeah, do a couple things. And finally, ask the question, are these dad movies? Is this a dad series? So with that, let's, uh, let's, let's kick it off with some casting crew. I think the best place to start is on the assassination of Jesse James, because this is the movie that people know the least, I think. I know it the least. Yeah. And uh, I don't know. Vito, do you want to? Do some of the cast and crew on it? Sure. As with the other two movies that we're covering, these are all adaptations. This is based off of a book written by uh, Ron Hansen and adapted by the film's director, Andrew Dominic. Um, you might know Andrew Dominic because he, he kind of came out the gates with Chopper, which I believe was an Australian film. Then he did this one, which is a really big announcement for a young director, you know, making almost a three hour epic. Um, but then he followed this with Killing Them Softly, which is a, a perennial favorite of mine. And of course, he's in the news right now because he just released Blonde, the Marilyn, sorry, not the Marilyn Monroe biopic because he can't legally say that. Right. But it's definitely about Marilyn Monroe. The adaptation of Joyce Carol Oates' novelization of, of Marilyn Monroe's life. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's starring Ana de Armas, courting quite some controversy right now. Um, yeah, just a little bit. Maybe deservedly. Yeah. But he's also done um, a couple episodes of Mindhunter, which is a, a show that I really love. Um, I think we've talked about it before. Yeah. He's an interesting guy, Andrew Dominic. Maybe we can get into kind of talking about how he differs from our other auteurs here. But he's helped by, of course, the, the uh, I believe we called him the, the granddaddy of cinematography on this show before, <laughs> Sir Roger Deakins. Sir Roger. The, the best of the best. Basically, if you've seen a movie and you were like, wow, that looked really good. It's probably Roger Deakins. <laughs> <laughs> it's like him or a couple others. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, this is starring Brad Pitt as Jesse James. Casey Affleck as Robert Ford. Also, Sam Rockwell, Jeremy Renner, Sam Shepard, Garrett Delahunt, Mary Louise Parker. Um, and you put, who's this, who's this last person? Oh, I don't know. Um, uh, I, that was, I put this together before I actually watched the movie. Oh, okay. So I don't know who this person is. <laughs> oh, I, I think that she was the little girl. Yeah, she, she was is. the girl. Uh, yeah. All right. It's, it's Brooklyn Prelude. Prue. 
Prue. Prue? Yeah. Prue. And I believe in a deleted scene, we had uh, Zoe Deschanel, but she's been cut from the film. Oh, no. I, in, the, in the version that I saw, she was definitely in it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Not the yeah, version she I was have. The, she was like the love interest of, At of the Robert very Ford. End. Yeah. Oh, yeah. that's right. I was, I was yeah. sitting there oh, saying, right. like, is that, jo- is that Zoe Deschanel? Like, that's not Zoe Deschanel. <laughs> no, no it's totally right. not. The credits come in and it's like, Zoe Deschanel. Like, oh, shit. What? <laughs> Zoe. Maybe I'm maybe I'm tipping my hand that my attention wandered at the end. <laughs> but that's so, yeah, that's run a little long. It's a it's a really big cast for for a movie like this. Yeah, um, and for like someone just like fresh out of the gate, one movie seven years previously. Yeah, right. Like that's it. And if you look at these stars too, like Brad Pitt's a big one, but Casey Affleck was not very well known at this point. I mean, he's like he's the younger brother running around Goodwill Hunting, right? right? And Sam Rockwell, I mean, had gotten some Academy attention for Confessions of a Dangerous Mind a few years prior, but is not a star. Neither is Jeremy Renner. He's nobody yet. He's not even in the MCU. Um, Sam Shepard has oh, been around Oh, he hadn't done the Hurt Locker yet. Yeah, no, that's 2009. Year. Mm, yeah. yeah. yeah um, nobody. Right. Yeah, but Sam yeah, Shepard and Garrett Dillahunt are just character actors. And Mary Louise Parker at this time was probably most famous for being in the TV show Weeds. Oh, yeah. So like these are all famous people, really famous people now. Yeah. But looking back, like that's only in hindsight. There's another really important actor here who's in a really important uh show. And I'm wondering if any of you guys know who this this person is. He's one of he's one of the gang. Yeah, he's uh Parks and Rec. Yeah. <laughs> it's uh what's his name? It's only in season one. Oh yeah, the first season. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. The guy, the guy oh, yeah. is like the, the terrible dude. Yeah. What's his name? Paul? Paul Schneider. Paul Schneider. Is the name of the actor. Yeah. And his name in the movie is Dick Little. Yep. Not Little. 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 Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Uh, maybe a pedophile. <laughs> the character, not the actor. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, really? Oh, yes. Definitely. Definitely. <laughs> not a good dude. Not a good dude. Dick, not a good dude. Dick Little Diddles. That's all I Dick can Little say. Dick Little Diddles. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> the cat and the fiddle? No. <laughs> Please, not the cat and the fiddle. <laughs> With the cat on the fiddle? The cat jumped over the moon. I don't know where I'm going. No, I'm just wondering if he used the cat up. to diddle the fiddle. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You should not make children's rhymes. <laughs> anyway. Uh, that was... Uh, that that's this is a very serious movie that we treated very <laughs> so <politely>. serious. <laughs> um, it is extreme. There's no laughter. It's well, there actually oh, no, is a good. Yeah, yeah. There's some good dialogue that's hilarious. Like the opening scene where, where you meet Dick Little and the gang is hilarious. Like I was laughing out loud at every line when when the one guy's he's like asking him like Could we write a letter to this one you know <laughs> yeah. that I met and he says something like writing he he recites this poem about like writing something you know to a lover you might as well write it on air or on water or something and he's like yeah let's write her that <laughs> <laughs> he has no idea what it means he just it sounds pretty uh, that, was, that was pretty funny yeah but maybe going over to uh there will be blood this is based off of oil with an exclamation mark by mm. written by upton sinclair directed of course by my one of my very favorite creators uh paul thomas anderson it's taken us a long time to work him on here. I know. it's. But then you look at his movies and you're like, okay, that kind of makes sense. <laughs> how, how do you talk about these movies? On- yeah. Heart Eight, or an Boogie A-Bogus. Nights, Magnolia, Punch Drunk Love, The Master, Inherent Vice, Phantom Thread, Licorice Pizza. I think the only one that's cl- we could have gotten closest to would have been like Magnolia. I think oh. we could talk about Licorice Pizza. Sorry, I, I'm I looking we at... Can- we, oh. we have a, a Google Doc and there's this great note about I started this in 2008. Who wrote that? This is oh, all that, Mike. That, that's me. That's me. Um, so, so the novel Oil. Uh, so Upton Sinclair is best known for his novel The Jungle, which is an expose on the meatpacking book. industry in Chicago. And Oil is similarly an expose on the oil industry. And I started it long time ago, right after watching this movie, and I tried to get into it. And I, I, I don't know, man. It's really dense. Maybe I was really dense at the time, but. I mm. still got the bookmark in the book. It's like on my bookshelf. Like I will read this someday. Okay. When but, I become really boring, I guess. I don't know. But, but it's um, not as good as there will be blood. It is not as good as it's there will be very, blood. It's very, very different. Like PTA talked about when he's, when he's putting it together, he actually based it 
base the character of Daniel Plainview on, on two historical figures that do factor into oil, but he went really far afield in his own research. They had to say this was based off of oil because they used like a lot of general events that occurred, yeah. but it's not like it's not like there was a character named Daniel Plainview in the book Oil. Yeah. This is compiled from a bunch of stuff, but like I guess that one just had the majority stakeholder, so he had to cite it as a mm. based on. Mm. That's really interesting. But this is shot by uh, Robert Elswit. Mostly works with PTA, but he's also shot Mission Impossible, Ghost Protocol, and Rogue Nation, Nightcrawler. Yeah, he's a very talented cinematographer. Yeah, he's, he's really, done, really done a lot stuff. of stuff. The stars Daniel Day Lewis is uh, Bill the Butcher. Yeah, I feel like he's channeling a lot of Bill the Butcher here, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot. He doesn't pontificate as much, which I right. appreciate. Yes, and he doesn't kill as many people. No, no. Very, very, very few. Very much less people. <laughs> and sadly, he doesn't say, oopsie daisy. Oopsie daisy! <laughs> I mean, the opportunities in this film, it was just rife with... So many times. I, I mean, there, yeah. I mean, he says it. He says drainage. <laughs> yeah. And that's pretty close. That's pretty drainage! <laughs> I just feel like when 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 that uh, when the one guy dies next to him when the thing gets dropped down the shaft, you could have been like, "Whoopsie daisy!" <laughs> Guys, these are really serious movies. Uh, just if you haven't seen them, like like they are actually serious. But Don't to take but to say the same around. thing that Dan said about assassination is that there will be blood is very funny. Oh, that's true. It's, it's true. very funny. It's true. It's just it, it it's it's funny with a deadpan expression, right? Yes. Oh, um, speaking of gangs of New York, though. I did read something that the the boy, the son of um, of Daniel Day Lewis's character, mm -hmm. he's actually H not an actor. Yeah. They, they they brought him in like when they were trying to convince the mother to let her son come into this movie. She had never really seen Daniel Day Lewis in a movie before, so she went to Blockbuster and gets Gangs in New York, <laughs> and was actually like, "No, I don't want my son anywhere near Bill the Butcher." <laughs> um, and so I guess they. Whoever I think it might have been Paul Th Thomas Anderson went and got Age, Age of Innocence. Yeah, there we go. And they like rent and rented that and brought that to her and were like, "Actually, he's a great guy. Look, he's a nice gentleman in this movie." <laughs> Don't watch and, Last uh, of the Mohicans. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so this little boy, uh, apparently his mom is a cop, and she pulled over the casting director. Well, they nice. were. No he way. Was, yeah, he was speeding at the. No way. She's like, yeah, we're making the movie. He was like. Can my son be it? <laughs> and they like arranged it then, which you know oh, wow. he Wait, probably so, got out of the ticket. Let's be honest, but yeah, like I feel like that's <laughs> that's great history for this movie. You know, like yeah, like the... and, and this is his only film credit. I yeah. believe he went off and did um, like Junior Rodeo after this. Really? Yeah, I believe yeah, he used his money. He's never done anything else film related besides this. This is it. This is HW. Yeah, Dylan Freezer, I guess, or Frazier. I don't know how you yeah. say that last name. But we got uh, Paul Dano doing double work as Paul and Eli Sunday and Kieran Hines as Fletcher. Yeah. And then there, there's a pretty deep bench here, too. There's like weird character actors like all of PTA's movies. He does cast comedians in tiny roles. Yeah. So I don't know if you want. I, I, I'm i sorry. No, I stole no, the no, thunder you, in the Slack no, chat. no, you do it. You do it. Mr. Peanut Butter. Mr. Peanut Butter. <laughs> what are you doing? What here? are you doing here? He is What's that guy's name? Paul F. Tompkins. Yeah, Paul F. Tompkins. Um, usually known for having a very fastidious little mustache and, mm -hmm. and a little bow tie. Um, he is in the beginning, I believe he's the, the silver horror um, or the silver guy at the very beginning mm -hmm. of the movie. Yeah, that, that's kind of all I had for, for cast. Did anyone else? That's all who I usually want to call out. Yeah. I, oh, I, oh, no, I'm sorry. There is one other guy. There is one other guy. Because this is related to something I said earlier. Kevin J. O'Connor. Okay. Kevin J. O'Connor. Mike hasn't seen The Mummy, so he doesn't know. But he is the slimy Weasley guy from The Mummy, who's always betraying Fred and Fraser. You guys remember mm, this guy? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Oh, hate him. Yeah. And oh, I, is he it, the brother? Yeah. Or the, or the brother? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. That makes that, sense. That actually connects. Now I knew I'd seen him somewhere, and now you say it. Yeah. It's kind of amazing because he, you know, he's so funny and greasy in The Mummy, right? And then here. He's a really good actor. Like you can see so much going on in his eyes. Uh, I I hadn't expected that anyway. Yeah, that's that's all I had. Is nothing else? Yeah, nothing else. I mean, I know there's like several several other like kids running around and, and stuff like that. Um, I feel like Paul Thomas Anderson <laughs> just must be a fantastic like director of act. Like he is a fantastic director, but he just is able to pull so much so much feeling out of people who you don't see around, right? Like. 
like most of the actors in here aren't famous people. Uh, most of the people that show up and yet they're yeah. able to but, like the dad, the um, yeah, Paul, Paul Dano's dad. Yeah. Oh, Easter yeah. Sunday. Yeah. Like, wow. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, there are some good side characters, but the star of the show here is Daniel Day-Lewis. He's in almost every scene, maybe in every scene. Um, I, I can only think of like two scenes, and one is the Sunday dinner. That's the only other scene I could think of he's not there for. Yeah. yeah. Or maybe when his son immediately gets blown off, but then he comes on the screen shortly after. Um, yeah. But yeah, Man. he's just he's carrying the entire movie on his shoulders, basically, with some... With some nice supporting people who are around, but like it's Daniel D. Lewis all the way here. Yeah. yeah. I remember Paul Dano's performance striking me a lot the first time I watched it though, because he, I, I'd never seen him in anything and I was like, whoa, this guy can act. He's every scene he's in, I can't keep, take my eyes away from him. Like he's so passionate and he's so subtle. Like he'll be, you know, jumping back and forth. And I'm sure we'll talk about this more about kind of the parallel parallels drawn between these characters, but yeah, Paul Dano's character is phenomenal. And I saw soon after this, I believe he was in prisoners and that solidified Mm -hmm. him in my mind of like, Mm -hmm. if this guy's in a movie, I want to see it because he's doing incredible things. He definitely plays a type. Yeah. From here on out. I think kind probably of, because kind of, of this like movie. a weak, like a weak little guy, yeah. right? but like a dangerous one. Yeah, like an unpredictable kind of not particularly fit, like just soft, soft white guy. Yeah, he's just like generally giving you creepy vibes. Yes, <laughs> if, if there is a place for that in your movie, call Paul Dana. Yeah, mm. and, and you know, and you know, uh, Matt Reeves did. He's like, hey, Paul, you want to be the Joker? You know, And Paul's That's like, right. no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I like that. That was a good one. Thank you. And then uh, our, rounding it out, we have uh, No Country for Old Men. This is based off the eponymous novel by Cormac McCarthy, um, a book I've read many times, adapted by Joel and Ethan Cohen, who are also the directors. We're big, big fans of the Coens. And this is, this is probably their most well-known movie and besides McCarthy. maybe like Fargo. And McCarthy. And McCarthy, yes. I'm also a big fan of McCarthy. Uh, this is also shot by Roger Deakins. Again, busy, busy man. Yeah. And maybe, like, as we get into the episode, I'd like to talk about how these two movies just look radically different from each other. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, they really do. And it stars uh, Tommy Lee Jones as our as our Sheriff Ed Tom, uh, Javier Bardem, Josh Brolin, Woody Harrelson, and Kelly McDonald. And also Garrett Dillahunt. And Garrett Dillahunt. Comes yep. back. Yep. Much less uh, definitely. Dumb. <laughs> dumb yeah still not the smartest guy there no, he's not he's not the sharpest yeah. bulb in the yeah. knife drawer yeah. um <laughs> all right of of these maybe sidebar here of three of these three movies which one of these has the best cast the best cast what is yeah. the best cast like what, what mean, does like, it mean to have the best the, cast? the like accumulated acting chops of all of the actors there on screen so like obviously i think the best actor is Daniel Day Lewis, I, I would say that hands down, but the best cast, all of them together. I mean, I'm going to go No Country because I know there's a lot of people mm-hmm. in Assassination. Right. There's not a lot of scenes with them all together. And there's not, there's moments of drama between several members of them at different times. But I think that in No Country, there's so much drama that each, each of these named actors, each of these five, they get with each other or they get with other characters. I just think that there's more complete roles there. And like for assassination, I mm-hmm. love what that there's a lot of those people there. Yeah. And I love that sneakily Sam Rockwell might be like the most fleshed out character amongst that supporting he, cast. He, oh my gosh. Yes. Yeah. But yeah. I, I, I just have to go no country for those reasons. And then I just don't think there's enough people in that. That's yeah. what I say. I feel yeah, like I, they're I, I, equal, equally great. Ooh. Like Daniel day Lewis plus Paul Dano equals the combined talent of everyone in the assassination of, of Jesse James at the time that assassination of Jesse James was made in that way. And also you know, country that's, that's my, that's my uh, yeah. thesis here. Okay. As, as far as like, m- I feel like memorable characters, memorable characters that Im- like impacted me and that I immediately associate with the, with the movie, right? Like if I think, there will be blood. I think of Paul Dano and mm-hmm. Daniel Day Lewis. Even if the other performances, like we said, with the you know Mister Sunday and 
they're great performances, but it's not what I think of when I think of a movie with no country. I immediately think of all five of these, like Vito was saying that Mm -hmm. all five of these movies or these uh, actors and actress are all so tied to the movie. I can't think of the movie without thinking of all five of them. It's not just Josh Brolin or just Tommy Lee Jones. It's, it's all of them. So I guess for that reason that there's so many and all of them are awesome. um, I'd pick the same. But everything's equal. Or no oh, uh, no country. All Sorry. Right. Okay. Same as Vito. I'm okay. Like, yeah. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm down. Yeah. I think it's no country for old men. The way sparks fly between all these characters and one of them's in a room with another one. It's pretty incredible. It's, it's like electrifying. And you get that with Paul Dano and Daniel Day Lewis or with uh, Casey Affleck and Brad Pitt as well. But like to have so many different dynamics all to come together and like mesh together uh, throughout a whole movie is it's, it's pretty insane. I haven't seen that in, in a lot of movies. Uh, so, I think yeah. it's the, the, the Cohen magic, right? Well, and also, like, another thing that I'm thinking about is, is like, if you say Javier Bardem or Josh Brolin, like, one of the first things that springs to mind is No Country for Old Men. And For Javier Bardem, for sure, it's the first thing. For Josh Brolin, I'm, I'm sorry, he's inevitable. Yeah, I, I just don't care. I don't <laughs> care Thanos. about Thanos. Like he's not. He's, I don't. Thanos I don't either. Is like but it's the first thing I think CGI. of. CGI. Well, yeah, it's true. He's the biggest. He's the biggest villain in the entire universe. He killed <laughs> half of everybody. He did, and not even the left or right <laughs> half, or the top or bottom. Yeah, just half. just half of everybody. He flipped okay. a coin. You know, he became Javier Bardem, but on a bigger scale. This is true. Yeah, I'm going to disagree with all y'all. <laughs> and I think of Dune when I think of Josh. <laughs> well, you know, fair, fair. That's that's true. It's in like 20 minutes. Have you movie. seen? <laughs> have you seen like? Uh, have you seen that new show he's in, like Outer Range or something? Yes, I've is been really- watching it recently. I like five. Is it any good? In. Just for Josh Brolin, it is just because of Josh Brolin that it's. Yeah. I, I, this show is not very good. It's it's crappy sci-fi and i'm pretty sure they're not going to tie any of this out but watching the cowboy josh brolin deal with the fact that there is a hole in his west pasture and not know what the f- to do with it and like praying <laughs> like insisting that he says a prayer at dinner and then like saying god i hate you there's an abyss in my yard <laughs> <laughs> it, it sounds it's, wonderful he's got some highbrow humor that he's bringing to it and also he's yeah he's the reason to watch any of that show nice all right, I'm gonna get to it. Gonna get. Right, to I'm it. gonna end that sidebar, by the way. Oh yeah. All right, that's done. That's done. Nice. Well, I think uh, I think we've talked. Wait, 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 wait. A lot of this. Wait, what famous musician play is in which one of, one of these movies? The um, famous musician. Radio sidebar. Radio. Musician sidebar. What famous musician is in which one of these movies? Is Nick Cave in one of these movies? Ah, and yeah. is it assassination? It is an assassination. Yeah, I think I thought I saw him. He plays music. Yeah. In the bar. Well, he's See, just you got, just know all this stuff. Like, well, I can't, he's just I can't. got such a raw bone face. Yeah. And Nick Cave, like, he he looks like, I don't, he looks mythical. <laughs> it's, it's, he's so tall and like his jaw gaunt. Yeah. Like he looks like he's seen the world since its inception, and he's not happy about it. <laughs> and I heard that song is actually a real ballad that was saying about Jesse James. Like it's yeah. from, really it's nice. from awesome. the time period. Yeah. That's rad. That is rad. <laughs> He, he did the music for that, too. For like he, and, he and another guy. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Like, that's a real person. This is this is a yeah. pretty real story, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Another musician thing. Radiohead what? guy? Yeah, okay. <laughs> there you go. You guys, <laughs> I, I, Tom York? Uh, no. Which one? Johnny Greenwood. The, oh, There Will Be Blood. So There Will Be Blood was his <laughs> first, um, that was his first, like, feature-length film that he scored. Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. And he's gone on to work with with PTA Moore. Yeah, and he's actually kind of. I mean, we saw him last year with. Uh, we just talked about him in Power of the Dog. Um, a it very similar sounds score. Pretty similar. Yeah. yeah. I mean, my wife was uh, like, hmm. like, man, that score reminded me a lot of Power of the Dog. Like, guess why? <laughs> <laughs> really, I actually don't hear it. Yeah, those those scores bring two totally different things to mind for me. There's a there's a the, the thing that I caught on to is that there's just a. a He's a very percussive composer, so he writes things that that either loop and repeat, or they have kind of a, an unsettling momentum. A lot of staccato, yeah, um, plucked strings, yeah, um, and mm-hmm. uh, boom, boom, but so interestingly, um, in he he didn't um, he was not 
able to be nominated for uh, like best score because right. he you, best original score because he used a ton of pre existing music, but especially because he used a pre existing Radiohead song and like riffed off of it in a lot of ways. But he had to credit you know Radiohead for it, um, and so he was unable to be nominated for not enough quote unquote original material. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Although like. Crazily enough, no country for old men got nominated for like best sound 13, editing, but it's like a 13 minutes of score. <laughs> well, so like what they did, though, did, what they did in no country was like they um, they had like a full score like done by by like uh, Carter so, Burwell. Yeah. Like someone who's like a serious like what we're going to do is we're going to mix this down into basically nothing, like almost yeah. nothing at all. So you can't, literally can't hear it and we're going to have it play the whole movie. And that's, is there a uh, score in No Country besides credits? There's some like, music, it, like can you can you hear? I don't remember anything. Like I remember some wind. I, I, I can't. Got I think yeah. I think that some of the sound editing, some of the sound design, actually is the soundtrack. Like I don't mean that like a like a whoa, pass the blood, bro. It is the soundtrack. I mean that they <laughs> literally mixed it as the soundtrack. They didn't record, you know, the ambient sound and let that play. They actually played sounds of wind. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I don't know. Okay. I don't know if there's notes, although I've been told there's notes, but I've seen this movie like yeah, 12 I, times yeah, and I, I've, never, I've never heard it. Yeah. Never, ever. Okay. Yeah. I didn't hear anything either. It's not even something I noticed until very, very end. Yeah. There's like, there's, there's no, there's no music in this thing. No. <laughs> yeah. So closing that sidebar. Hey everyone. Jumping in real quick to tell you about something I'm personally very excited for. It's Sir's Furniture. S I double R S furniture. Now, if you've been listening to our podcast for a long time, then you know about Sir. He was, we did the the crossover with the uh, Before Sunset trilogy. He's been on a couple of our episodes. I've been on a couple of his. Um, He's a dear friend. And he happens to make, besides a fantastic podcast, beautiful, custom made wood cutting boards of, of whatever flavor of wood you want in whatever kind of design you want. It's, it's beautiful custom work. And with summertime coming up, I know that I'm going to be out barbecuing. I'm going to be out going to birthday parties. I'm going to be going to a couple of weddings and it's sometimes hard to pick, you know, what to give somebody, uh, what to give a friend of mine. Sir's Furniture is your one-stop shop for cutting boards, charcuterie boards, coasters, anything that you can really think of that is handmade, handcrafted, and designed woodcraft. You've been using a small plastic board for years. You know you have. Or, you know, take a look in your kitchen at those dried out twigs that you call cutting boards. And go to sirsfurniture.com, S-I-R-R-S furniture.com slash N-Y-F-M. And check out the wide selection of beautiful handcrafted wooden cutting boards that are on display there. Now, listen, let me tell you a little bit ago when Mike welcomed in his third child to the world, um, Jesse and I banded together and we we pitched in on, on one of the big Bertha, I think it's called the Martha of the, the cutting boards. It was big, it had a nice channel around the side, and we put Mike's last name right in the middle. And this board was gorgeous. I was upset that I didn't have Mike's last name so that I couldn't just keep it for myself. It was the single most beautiful cutting board I've ever seen. So that whether you love to cook, barbecue, or just need that perfect gift, Sir has what you need. So for 10% off, use our link, Sir's Furniture. That's S-I-R-R-S furniture.com slash N-Y-F- um, that'll tell him that we sent you. Uh, let's move into nostalgia. Dan, what kind of nostalgia do you have for these movies? Uh, so the one that I have the most nostalgia for is actually There Will Be Blood. Um, I saw that, I think, the earliest of the three. Um, I want to say when I was 20, maybe. So like... A couple years after it came out, I, did, I didn't see any of these movies the year they came out. Um, I think I was just too young. And I was, you know, a teenager and these movies weren't really on my radar. Like, I didn't know who the Coen brothers were. I didn't know who, who PTA was. So it wasn't until 
I started listening or started watching movies based on directors, which was like in my early 20s. Essentially, a buddy of mine gave me a list of like 10 directors and he's like, if it's if it's directed by these guys, you should watch it. So that became my watch list for years, actually. Um, I just tried to catch up on whatever these, you know, and the Coen brothers was one PTA was another. And so I watched them in my early twenties, mm. no, no country and there will be blood. I had very similar, um, experiences with them where they, they kind of broke the mold of what I expected in a movie. I was, you know, I was very used to like things being a little more obvious, like, everything's kind of like handheld for the viewer. This is the beginning of the movie. So this, the, the characters are going to tell you how the, you know, what the plot is. They're going to tell you what the premise is. They're going to set things up. They're going to tell you what's going on. And neither of these movies do that. They, they let the viewer do the work. They show respect for the viewers by doing that. Like no country. It, uh, there's a lot of unspoken strategy and a lot of unspoken plot that goes on. And it's like the the show don't tell type of strategy. Like instead of telling you, well, the reason that he like closed the blinds is so that later on when he shows up, if they're cracked open a little bit, then he knows that somebody's in his room. Like they didn't say that he didn't have to say that, but they, they do it. And it's so subtle. And it's, I feel like as the viewer, I feel like it's paying me respect that I can be intelligent enough to catch on to what the characters are intending. And, and it also means that if I miss anything, I might catch it the second, third, fourth time. And that's even more satisfying where you pick up on things that you missed. And so for both of those movies, it really changed my expectation for movies and also TV shows. I think that these two movies are why I enjoy shows like Fargo or even to some extent like Better Call Saul or Breaking Bad, the movies that have a respect for the viewer where they're, they're going to have symbolism. They're going to have bigger themes going on. They're going to have, yeah, just, just have that respect for the viewers. And um, so both of those movies hu- hugely impacted my movie watching experience in my life. Assassination of Jesse James, not so much only because I, I was recommended it back in the same period of my life. And for whatever reason, I think I watched like the first five minutes of it and I was really tired and I just like turned it off cause I knew it was going to be slow and I never went back to it. Um, actually fu- oddly enough, um, my wife and I at some point made a list of movies that she and I wanted to watch together. And we only had like four movies on it. And this was one of them. So this movie has been written on a whiteboard down by my kit in my kitchen for like two years and <laughs> we just never watched it. I think it was the time, how long it is and the slowness of it that we never got to it. But, um, I was very excited to watch it. I knew it was going to be something great. And it, I, I absolutely loved it. I, it immediately was a five star movie for me. And I actually started watching it again the other day. Like I've already, it's, I never do that nowadays. I never watch a movie within like the same month twice, but I actually just really wanted to start watching it again. I wanted to, to like hear the score and see these characters and, and watch this cool. epic drama play out again so definitely impacted me quite a bit and um yeah i I think it'll be it'll be up there with these three movies now as like go-to movies if i need something really impactful really dramatic kind of bummers obviously (laughs) um big bummers yeah just really impactful yeah i guess uh for my nostalgia i have pretty deep nostalgia for all these i saw them all um i think in the same month uh back in college 2007 i wanted to see all of them and i'd asked my parents because at the time uh, i was like younger high school i was like can you you know they had to watch movies before i could watch them especially if they were rated r and so i asked them i really wanted to see there will be blood in no country for old man they watched both of them and they hated them they hated them so (laughs) much which only deepened my desire to see them. <laughs> my parents hated that means I need to see it now. Yeah, don't yeah, eat yeah. the cookies in the cookie jar. <laughs> exactly. They're bad. Oh, they're bad. Oh, I want to know how bad they are. Oh, I want to know. <laughs> so uh, I, but I knew about the assassination of Jesse James, but when I asked my parents about that one, I think it's because they had just seen the other two. They were like, no, <laughs> like no stop watching depressing Westerns. But it became kind of an odd object of like 
fetishism almost for me because I would watch these trailers over and over and over again. It was the closest I could get to them. I remember reading No Country for Old Men and just being in awe of the book, uh, loving it so, so much. And I and I read uh, The Jungle by Upton Sinclair and I never got my hands on oil. But, well, I've got it for you. It's half read. Well, thank you. Well, I mean, you just <laughs> have to download that knowledge to me. <laughs> uh, yeah, so these have been in my life for a long time. I remember finally being in college and I I, I bought them all on, on like the original run of Blu-rays in 2008. So they're janky. So the 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 menu for No Country for Old Men has like the runtime on the menu. Huh. <laughs> and it, it's anyway, uh these are very near and dear to my heart. I've I've rewatched No Country probably the most. It was the first one I saw. Then I saw There Will Be Blood. Initially really did not like There Will Be Blood. And then had to kind of come around to it. But that's how I've actually found over the years is how I, I usually approach Paul PTA. Yeah, movies. that's like every single one of his movies. Every single one of them. I just, I hate them. And then yeah. I grow, they grow to be one of my favorite movies of all time after I keep watching them. Because there's something in them that is really fascinating to me. And uh, The Assassination of Jesse James, I saw it uh, the one time. And I was, I was awestruck. And I always wanted to share it with more people. But in, it, it, like Dan is saying, it's a hard ask. Um, it's a hard one. And so I, this is actually only the second time I've rewatched it, and having seen it, what, 11 years ago? Yeah, wow. So at least for No Country and There Will Be Blood, these are perennial rewatchables for me. I have I love watching them. I think they're beautiful and masterpieces. And I used to think that about The Assassination. I don't think it's a masterpiece now. I think it's very good. But I'd like to get into that into that more a little bit later. But that's that's my nostalgia. The, it runs as deep. These these three run as deep as, as it can run. Back to when I was when I was 18 year old. And even younger, wanting to experience what these helped define what adult cinema meant to me. You know, difficult watches, heavily lauded and praised and controversial and, and all that. With acting, you know, mm. people are acting in these movies. <laughs> Javier Bardem got a bowl cut. <laughs> <laughs> the sacrifices he made. He said he didn't get laid for like five yeah. months. <laughs> It's like, probably, you know probably helped to fuel his uh, his rage. His rage <laughs> yeah. in the movie. You look like a serial killer. <laughs> That's what I got. Uh, these are big ones for me. But Jesse, uh, please. Yeah, two thousand seven. So similar to Vita, like I was, I was aware of all of these. I, there, I'd seen the trailers. I had wanted to see all of them at some point. This is when I was like really follow, not really following. Like I was trying to understand movies and try to try to follow them. Obviously, I knew who the the Cohen brothers were. Uh, like we had watched them in, in my fam, or at least some of their movies in my family growing up. But for all of these movies, I never saw any of them in two thousand seven when they came out. Like all for different reasons. For No Country is because my parents didn't like it, and same thing. Like when you're fifteen, like I couldn't drive myself. My friends didn't really drive yet. How how am I going to get to the theater? Like mom, and dad got to take me, and they don't like it, so there's no way I'm seeing that. And I didn't see it till like till like years later. Um, and then for There Will Be Blood, I remember not being sure about that one, right? It, it's got like that title, There Will Be Blood. You're like, ooh. What does like, that really mean? Violent. Yeah. And, then, <laughs> and then I remember my brother came over and I'm like, ah, you know, I saw There Will Be Blood. It's like, oh, like, what is it about? <laughs> like, <laughs> Was there well, any it's blood? About, it's about a, a bad guy, basically. The protagonist is a bad guy. <laughs> and uh, he has a... a you know, an oil business. It's like, oh, does he, does he kill lots of people? It's like, hey, he kills a guy at the end. It's like, oh, that's pretty lame. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't sound like my kind of movie. <laughs> and then for the assassination of Jesse James, like, I remember seeing the runtime, run and I had read Roger Ebert's review of it at the time, which made me not want to watch it. Um, did, he, did he give it two or three stars? He actually gave it three and a half, but uh, the way oh, wow. his review opens up is, um, and I'm going to quote Roger Ebert here, few things have earned me more grief from readers than my suggestion that in the sport of sex, Captain Renault of Casablanca plays for both teams. I think I will get, <laughs> <laughs> I think I will get less disagreement when I focus on the homosexual undertones of the assassination of Jesse James and the coward. Robert Ford. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. The <laughs> cigar is... play in this movie. <laughs> Since sex That's between beautiful. them is out of the question, their relationship turns to a curiously erotic dance of death. It is clear to both of them and to anyone reading the title what must happen at the end, and they move together toward that event with almost trance-like 
inevitability. <laughs> ah, I mean, I mean, erudite as always. My 15 year old self read that and was like, wow, this is basically like a sequel to Brokeback Mountain right here. I'm not sure if this is what I really want to see. Yeah. And it's like two hours, 40 minutes. <laughs> There's no yeah. way. There's no way I could see this because I've been really excited because his name is Jesse James and my name is Jesse. Like, yeah, if it, if it has Jesse in it, I'm there. Uh, Outlaws, they're robbing trains, there's assassination. Sounds great. <laughs> And then there's erotic sex, apparently. But no, that's not even what that <laughs> review was saying. Um, yeah. But yeah, didn't even see that till years later. But for There Will Be Blood, I saw that first, like, in college. Friend of the pod, Nick Murphy. I was just talking to him one time. I think it was about Breaking Bad. And then he asked me if I had seen There Will Be Blood. Of course, he said no. He's like, we're watching it. And he goes and gets his laptop right then and right there. And I sit and watch it with him on a laptop. And the first the thing he tells that it me was is like, meant to be seen. <laughs> <laughs> the first thing he tells me is like, you should really listen to the score here. It was made by this, the Radiohead guy. It's like, oh, okay. And I'm listening to the score. I'm like, hello, Nick. This is kind of atonal. <laughs> I, don't <know> this, <laughs> I don't know if I like this. <laughs> and he's just, and then I keep watching it. I'm like, oh, they haven't said any words yet. <laughs> Why haven't they said any words, Nick? It's like, they don't say words for the first 20 minutes. I'm like, why do you like this movie? And, and then, like, it keeps going on. And, and like, I, I, don't, I don't think I responded to it well. But There Will Be Blood is personally, like, really grown on me. I haven't even watched it since then. Like, I've watched it, like, last week. But there was, like, a 10-year span where I hadn't watched it. And, like, I it just, like, percolated in the back of my head. Because as I've known more people like this guy, like Daniel Plainview... As I've realized that this is a kind of person that exists in the world, and and I've seen more art like Breaking Bad or Better Call Saul being the top ones, or even read like John Steinbeck novels, which I think this movie kind of really replicates in some ways. I've had more of a framework to build in my life where I I really like this movie. So watching it again, it was kind of a blast. It really holds up. That oh. that that oh, lifts my spirits. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> and so I hate this movie because <laughs> you, know, you know what you, know what you, you know what, you know what movie I'm gonna say. Passed the ghost out of me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. Whoa. That's good. There will be, uh, no uh, no country for old men. That is a movie I saw and I stopped watching movies because of it. <laughs> Whoa, <laughs> that was probably like 2017. I was just like, look, I've got like that was when you know uh, I had I was working at, at a school where I was getting like punched and spit on every day. It was, life was kind of rough. Could, uh, could you please describe the school so that that, that makes sense to people? <laughs> uh, if I say special ed school, that's not going to help anybody understand what happened there. Well, uh, I mean, it's, it's something. It's not just like, I mean. <laughs> I mean, it's it's tr- it's a school where students would do that to me. And yeah, it was, they they had a lot of needs. Their Their needs were so severe, they couldn't be in public school. They had to be in a special setting. And if they didn't work out here, they went to an institution for the rest of their lives, basically. That's that's where I worked. So every day, that's, you know, I'd come home and I'd, we'd want to watch something. And then, like, I felt like we were just watching, like, one depressing movie after another. I can't remember what they all were, but the straw that broke the camel's back was No Country for Old Men. I just came back. <laughs> we watched oh, this. That's just like, what the hell is wrong with Hollywood? <laughs> like, can't, can't they just make movies that are like charming? Don't, don't they know what movies are supposed to be? They're supposed to be where you come back at the end of the day and just enjoy life. Not, not whatever the fuck this is. Life is meaningless. Is that what we're getting here? And I like, I think I went on a good solid rant about this and it's just like you know i'm done we're just gonna stick with the office for like years because i don't know what else to do with it. <laughs> like because i still have this issue a little bit i like i've kind of grown out of this mostly but like i still have an issue where i think most movies are too dark and we fixate on that too much so i kind of look for it so that's why i'm happy when things like coda win best picture instead of power of the dog yeah so yeah if, so you're saying there is no Hollywood for old men. Uh, <laughs> uh, or that they d- hard. Yeah. Or you're just saying that they just needed a new coda, right? Is that, no, if they just needed a new coda. Oh, the puns. But, and then Assassination, I have no nostalgia except for what I mentioned with Assassination, except I watched it, and the cinematography is the best I've ever seen in any movie ever. Yeah. That's beautiful. I, I still want to talk, I want to, like, let that movie sit longer. <clears throat> But the cinematography is pretty amazing. 
and I still I'm anxious to talk about like almost all three of them pretty in depth and deeply because something about these all deserve lots of discussion, lots of lots of time sitting in your head and then coming at just talking about this. So I'm excited to be here. Uh, well said. Awesome. Yeah, so I have a ton of nostalgia. This is your birthday. For, yeah, it's my birthday. Um, for No Country for Old Men and and There Will Be Blood. Uh, I think I saw No Country for Old Men first, and so so this movie. Um, this is the first time I, I was. I think I was seventeen uh, when we watched this. It was after it was out of theaters, and uh, and uh, thought, but the Oscars hadn't happened yet, and so. We watched this, I don't know, either in like the winter of, of 2007 or the, the early 2007 or early 2008. And uh, so so I watched this with the guy that, that showed me and, and his sons a lot of really fantastic movies like Reign of Fire and U571. Mm-hmm. We'd watch, you know, Ocean's Eleven together, all these fantastic movies that are, you know, high on the on the dad catalog of like action movies um, with, you know, like some serious uh, some serious heart to them. And then one day he came over um, and he picked me up from, from my house. He was like, Hey, you're going to come over. You're going to spend the night and we're going to watch uh, no country for old men tonight. I was like, what? Like I, I had been reading about no country for old men because I was, I would always read the newspaper about like what was going on. It was the first time that I was like really, really interested in, in what was going on in the Oscars um, and uh, like sort of paying attention wanted to actually see the movies that were in it. And so he also was like, we, we were kind of talking about it, me and my buddies and, and him and like, okay, you know what? Like, I think no country for old men might be a good movie. And he had actually seen it uh, in theater. So he's like, all right, when it comes out on video, like we're going to, we're going to get it and we're going to watch it. So we did. And it was incredible. I loved it. Um, it blew, blew, completely changed my perspective on, um, on art. Uh, I feel like I've said that about a lot of movies, but that's just because like it's the nature of the show It's the nature of the show. But this one, more than any other sort of introduced me to the world of like, like movies that could say things, um, movies that had acting and were wrestling with big questions that I was wrestling with myself, questions about death, fate, mortality, life, like what's it all, what's it all for? And it was with, you know, like Tommy Lee Jones. I think we'd seen The Fugitive pretty recently. So it was kind of cool to, to go like that. And so I don't care. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we talked about it until like two or three in the morning after we finished the movie. We we're talking about all the symbolism and the imagery and, and all this stuff and making just huge claims, you know, about about life and whatnot. But he was there with us. Like he was ex- as excited about it, if not more than we were. And then they came over for dinner at my house the next night and we were hanging out and we were sort of like, not really talking too much. When we did talk, we talked about No Country for Old Men. We were just sort of sitting there and I was like, you know, do you guys want to watch it again? <laughs> <laughs> so he drove down to his house, picked the movie up, came back up to our house and we turned it on in the garage and we stayed up again until two or three in the morning talking about this movie. It was, it was a really special event, a really special moment to uh i don't know to experience like a grown man being as excited about something as i was like someone who was like a man you know he had children of his own you know they were my friends and and that was that was really cool also Come, also cool dad award there that's i mean it was that's yeah. that's a cool thing to 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 deal with something this challenging this violent um and to to try and like do it with you guys yeah it wasn't just like ha- here's a violent movie yeah. And he's like, no, like we should we should discuss this. It should be something. I mean, I'm just trying to imagine just myself, like putting myself in his shoes, trying yeah. to look at my kids and my kids' friends who come over to watch this, you know, very violent, fairly nihilistic film, and then try and and shepherd a discussion that meant something. It, it was difficult. amazing. And like the thing is, he didn't like he didn't really force any part of the conversation. Like he was having the conversation with us. Um, it was, it, it was remarkable. And yeah. Uh, yeah. It's a well, great what, man. So I still don't have this relationship with no country. So like, what, what did you guys talk about? Can't, I don't, no, I don't like, know if we could do this now. Oh, we can't do it, but you know what? I want to hear okay, can I okay. get like a couple cool bullet points from that, from these 2am conversations. Y- yeah. Um, 
Okay, like uh, what's a what's a uh, a teaser teaser for next week? Oh all yeah, you listeners. Like two weeks from now. Um, two weeks from now. I well, don't know. We'll talk about it more. <laughs> teaser for later. <laughs> next time you'll see coins and mm-hmm. the uh, unstoppable force of death. I don't know. Like it's not. It's not really. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't know. Have you seen the movie? Like, like. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't well, it turns know. Out I, I have. Yeah, I know. I feel like <laughs> to a seventeen-year-old who's just seen this movie for the first time, I, you know, I've never seen Unforgiven. I've never seen like mm. like so many things that I have seen now. This is an introduction to a whole new world of um, of, of art that like asks questions about about what is the nature of man, like what is the nature of our world here? Is it good or is it evil? There is it's it's a recognition of of the 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 true evil in the world, but also like shows us really good people, like people who are actually good, and and that you know the inevitable conclusion of the film, and what does that mean? How do we go on with our lives then after seeing this film, and and uh, and what do we do with it in our own lives? That, those were the kinds of discussions that we had. The evil you see in this film. It's hard to take its measure. Exactly. But uh, yeah. what about what about your your There Will Be Blood? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we saw There Will Be Blood a couple weeks later um, because, like, at that point, we were as invested in the Oscars as I've ever been. We'd seen 310 to Yuma earlier. We were watching all these all these movies. I, we didn't watch all of them. Um, but uh, but so we, we watched There Will Be Blood. Um, and at the time, it was not as much. We, we didn't love it as much. I think that there's like, as I've grown older, my estimation of the movie has has continued to increase while my estimation of No Country for Old Men has stayed exactly the same. It's I love it wholeheartedly the same way I did when I was 17 years old. And I think, you know, like, I don't think that that my understanding of it has changed all that much in the years, whereas I've gained a lot more over over the course of the years with no with There Will Be Blood. Haven't seen it as as often by a long shot, but it was definitely like what, another one of those movies where you're like, like you, we walked out of that one being like, I don't know if I'm ready to reckon with this. I don't know if I'm old and like I don't know if I've experienced enough of the world to reckon with this. There's a darkness in that movie that I, that that I experienced that was darker, but also more humorous than No Country for Old Men, which was which was really interesting. Um, but yeah, we watched it with the same the same group of guys uh, with with my um, my good friends, uh, and we we talked about watching uh, the assassination of Jesse James for years, um, and just never got around to it because you know it's like a long movie. It wasn't in the Oscar conversation, um, and it kind of gives away the ending, you know. Yeah, you know what's gonna happen. <laughs> and that's the thing. It was like, well, I know what's gonna happen. How could could it be? Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm just gonna say. I think the title of the movie does the biggest disservice to it because I I've never liked it. I've never liked that title. Uh-huh. And also I've never really liked the title of there will be blood either. And frankly, uh-huh. I think the assassination of Jesse James should be titled. There will be blood and there will be blood should be titled something completely different. Oil. <laughs> oil. It could be titled oil. It could be titled like the blood in the earth. The libations of gods. There's so many options. Like there the will be assassination of Eli Sunday. The assassination of Eli Sunday. Spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah, that's a good. Yeah, that's a good point. I'm really glad that I saw it though. Like finally, after all these years. So like when I saw an Instagram post, it was by like I don't know. I, I, I saw like the same IGN one. or something. Yeah, yeah. Um. Was like I was like, oh, like comparison. now this is the time. Like right now is the perfect time to finally watch that movie and like. It w- it really impact like it really affected me. I was I'm like sorrowful that I didn't see it way back when it came out because it would have been an incredible pairing with these other movies. It was be- beautifully filmed and definitely has a lot left a lot to think about. Um, yeah, my nostalgia and first impressions of these three movies. Should All right, we, we nice. hop out. Yeah, so uh, that is the end of the first part of our episode. We got more to come, obviously. There's a lot more to talk about here. But for this evening, from all of us at Not Your Father's Movies, I'm Mike. I'm Beto. I'm Dan. I'm Jesse. Thanks for listening. Good night. 
Thank you for listening to this episode of Not Your Father's Movies. Please let us know what you think about movies and our discussions on our Twitter at NYF Movies on our Not Your Father's Movies Facebook group. Follow us on Instagram or email us at notyourfathersmovies at gmail.com. Also, please consider supporting us on Patreon. This podcast has cost us a lot of time, effort, and money. Please consider contributing and we will start sending you monthly newsletters, our bonus WhatsApp episodes, and even an NYFM mug. We hope to hear from you soon. Lastly, thank you to Max Augers for our awesome theme playing right now, and to Andy LaFave from Don't Dance for the remix that you hear at the beginning of every episode. Thanks again for listening to Not Your Father's Movie.